And we are back and joining us for our second conversation this morning. We have in studio with us uh, folks from the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Dr. Cynthia Terry, the project coordinator, and Kim Bok. Bautista, the Vector Control Chief of Operations, and joining us via Zoom, we have Dr. Job Joseph, who is the Malaria Advisor for PAHO Belize. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Thank good you. Good morning, everybody. All right. Well, for those of us at home and for myself, can you talk to us a little bit about World Malaria Day? What is the Ministry of Health doing about that, and how, what is the campaign like? Okay, good morning. So um, today is um, being celebrated um, globally as World Malaria Day. Mm -hmm. um, it's being celebrated locally under a modified team, maintaining a malaria-free Belize starts with me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and World Malaria Day is basically an opportunity for the, <clears throat> the global community to basically voice um, our concerns in order to keep malaria high on the political agenda globally mm -hmm. um, simply because there are still regions globally where um, malaria is responsible for a high number of deaths mm -hmm. okay. so especially in, in several countries in continental Africa so um, it, it gives us an opportunity um, as I said uh, to keep it high on the political agenda um, for us locally um, we have basically enjoyed three consecutive years of zero local uh, cases. So um, it gives us the opportunity to embark on a campaign basically to sensitize and, and empower um, residents, uh, citizens um, to basically take ownership to prevent the reintroduction or the reestablishment of malaria in Belize. So. Um, that's basically the, the, the purpose of, of um, observing um, or commemorating uh, World Malaria Day. Is it that <clears throat> more and more Belizeans are aware of certain responsibilities that we have individually or collectively when it comes to malaria awareness? Because I ask because one of the key things that we've always been taught by way of an awareness campaign or in the classroom setting, for instance, is you need to do away with um, receptacles mm -hmm. that, that would have water that would allow for mosquitoes to breed and what have you. If we're saying that we're at a zero rate at this point for the past three years, is it that we've finally understood that you know, we need to get rid of all of these <laughs> um, receptacles and these items that would be breeding ground for, for vector-borne diseases? Yeah, um, okay, let's, let's establish um, early on, okay, um, th there's basically two campaigns that tend to um, occur simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, when we speak about uh, mosquito vectors in Belize, you're talking about those that, Aedes vectors that will transmit dengue, mm -hmm. Zika, chikungunya. Mm -hmm. Then you're talking about Anopheles vectors that will transmit yeah. malaria. Mm -hmm. Um, dengue being more of a urban uh, type uh, um, vector-borne disease, mm -hmm. uh, malaria um, traditionally it's, it, it's, it, it occurs in rural areas. So okay. um, what has happened over time is that we've been focusing quite a bit over recent years on, on dengue. Mm -hmm. um, as you rightfully said, um, speaking about um, having that shared responsibility, um, getting rid of breeding sites and things mm -hmm. like that. So that is because dengue uh, over recent years have, has been, I would say, the primary vector-borne disease in the region. I, if you look at 2019, um, that was the highest record number of dengue cases within the region on record. Mm -hmm. Now malaria um, in this region, it is still of primary concern. Um, it's falling almost into the category of a neglected tropical disease simply because um, as the burden of the disease is going down, uh, it, less resources is being basically being put into these campaigns mm -hmm. to sensitize persons. So um, that's why you would tend to see more, more visibly um, us focusing on, on the dengue campaign, but silently We've been working over the years with respect to, to, to malaria, which um, 
uh, if it, it, I, I believe only yellow fever uh, has um, has been a more long-standing or, or the first major vector-borne disease prior to to, to malaria um, locally. So, but the malaria program itself is a program that uh, precedes, I would say. Um, Officially, it organized back in 1957, mm -hmm. but there were record. Um, there are records that show even from the 30s that um, majority um, of um, hospitalizations and, and a significant amount of deaths, in even in the 30s and the 40s, were related to malaria in British Honduras, which is um, now Belize. So, but over time, um, there have been efforts uh, to eradicate this um the, this disease um starting which started in the i think in 1957 with the global malaria eradication efforts and um, that was mostly funded by by um, unicef i believe at the time but over time um we've had success um but then eventually it, it the program went from a national malaria eradication service to a national vector control program and it started integrating, as you said, dengue, um, uh, chikungunya, Chagas disease, uh, malaria, um, among other diseases. So uh, the, the, the whole dynamics has transitioned quite a bit over the years, but the program itself has, has basically been focusing mostly on malaria and, and, and dengue. Let's and get back. Sorry, go ahead. And just to complement what Mr. Bautista has said, um, I know you spoke about if we've learned to eliminate receptacles mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. made changes in our environment, but also with having malaria being integrated into the vector control program, um, there have been advances as well in the distribution of um, long lasting insecticide nets into different communities. So that has been successful as well and targeting micro areas where uh, the incidence would have been higher or where the risk of transmission would have been higher. We've also been um, fortunate to have access to medications that are still working for our people that are exposed to malaria as well. In many countries, some of these medications no longer work. They're resistant in Belize. We're lucky that these medications still work. Yeah. So that has also helped us. We've also have access to recently to more um, uh, diagnostic methods that are rapid, that are easier to use out in the communities. So you don't have to wait two weeks or three weeks to get a malaria test mm -hmm. result. Now you can go to your community health worker that can do the test and you can get a result within 15, 20 minutes. So that also has contributed to the efforts as well. And um, we've enlisted a lot of voluntary collaborators in the community. So it's no longer a problem just related to the medical field per mm -hmm. se, mm -hmm. but we see more and more communities taking ownership of um, trying to uh, eliminate malaria as well. So all of that has contributed as well. So for, for this year's campaign, and we understand like you gratefully mentioned, um, COVID kind of took the front forward on a lot of the, the, the ministry and, and World Health Organization um, efforts to, to try to um, bring down that, that pandemic to a, to a halt. Um, for this year, when it comes to World Malaria Day, what is the campaign structure like? You are the, the project coordinator, so how is the ministry working along with PAHO to get the campaign and the word out there about malaria? So maybe Dr. Job wants to come in on this and talk about... Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you very much for this question. I think it's very, very relevant. I mean, we do have COVID and we know that, and the Ministry of Health is doing uh, is making effort to bring down COVID cases, uh, but malaria is still with us. And then we have the unique opportunity of having eliminated malaria for good. I mean, we will not have malaria if it is eliminated in our country. Now, the fact that we have COVID, um, Ministry of Health, PAHO, IDB, and other partners, we've been uh, very strategic in the last few years where like Dr. Sincha was saying, we have now all the tools like um, rapid diagnostic tests. I mean, even though we don't have our microscopies working in a week on a weekend, for example, that person with signs and symptoms of malaria can still get a test done. This year, while our focus or I mean our focus is on COVID, we still think that malaria is still there, and that's the reason why we are trying to raise awareness about malaria elimination. We want health 
professionals. We really want also other people working in the malaria community to know that malaria still exists in Belize and we have the unique opportunity to eliminate the disease. I mean, that's why we're working together, PAHO, IDB, the Ministry of Health, together to, to, to raise awareness on malaria elimination in the country. I don't know if, Dr. Cynthia, I want to compliment or if you want me yes. to say a little bit more about that. Sure. And um, we talk about COVID affecting malaria efforts. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it has. I mean, Mr. Bautista can tell you how many of his vector control supervisors have mm -hmm. been diverted to um, a COVID campaigns and vaccination and mm -hmm. testing, etc., yeah. to support the national effort. But at the same time, um, COVID has also helped us in a way that it has closed our borders. Mm -hmm. So uh, the risk of importation of malaria into Belize from our neighbors like Guatemala, Mexico, Honduras, mm -hmm. Nicaragua actually reduced as well. So we were kind of in a bubble like Mr. Yeah. Bautista likes to, to call. Mm -hmm. We were in a bubble. So mm -hmm. now that that bubble <laughs> has been opened, now we actually um, have to uh, make sure we put Increase. a lot of effort yes. into awareness, into testing Vigilance. and ramping up all the surveillance efforts that we've kind of um, mm -hmm. put aside for COVID during this time. I always, um, then, yes, go something, ahead. something I would want to add also, I mean, because Belize is receptive, that's when the mosquito is everywhere in Belize, the risk will still remain with us. I mean, mm -hmm. the idea is now, as Dr. Cynthia just said, and Mr. Bautista always said, we are not anymore in the bubble because <laughs> the border is not closed anymore. I mean, we will have people coming from neighboring countries where malaria is still endemic, not only from the neighboring countries, people coming <clears> from all of <throat> Africa to visit us. I mean, the probability of having malaria we established in Belize is still high. I mean, we still need to have proper surveillance to control and trying to timely detect any malaria case that might happen in our country. Over. I, um, for, for me, my, my generation, it wasn't really malaria. It was cholera, it was chikungunya, it was dengue, um, um, leishmaniasis, and so forth. So I only recently realized that malaria was a thing in Belize when I had to go abroad, and they're like, you need a malaria test mm -hmm. because you are from this country yeah. that is on a list that says you have X amount of cases of malaria yearly. Why is it that Belizeans are still unaware of this data um, that surfaced in our country. We, when we think about malaria, we think about cases in, in other third world countries. So what, where is the education gap there? Yeah, I, I think um, as I um, alluded to earlier in terms of the looking at the morbidity of the disease over time, if you look at, um, and I, I had provided some um, some images some maps and stuff um, uh, to share with with, with you guys um if you look, look at the in the 90s you had about 60 70 percent of most communities in this country and they're well over 200 uh with multiple malaria cases um and and so looking at that transition over time to where we are now uh, in 2022 at zero i i think that um we we as i said a, a lot of funds have have had to be diverted to education campaigns for for other activities if you look at 2014 um 2013 and 14 with the introduction of chikungunya mm -hmm. in the region and then um in 2016 it was the introduction of of um of zika in the region so the, you're talking about the vector control program is basically a small program that operates with roughly about 63 staff countrywide um, and they're responsible for all vector-borne diseases um, and all operations on the ground so um, we we tend to um, look at what is basically the the, the priority at the time um, and in the, in the case of malaria um, there are certain routine operations that even up to current day we still conduct so we distribute insecticide treated bed nets to targeted localities we also do house spraying which is what you're, you're familiar with mm -hmm. the indoor residual spraying mm -hmm. so um, that that's a little bit of um, what we, we we've had to be uh, i've had to do over time but in terms of um as you mentioned about being on on, on a, like a, a travel list a warning and stuff like that 
I think I would want to take the opportunity to also discuss the benefits of being declared uh, malaria free. And today, being um, World Malaria Day, um, the Ministry of Health, the Minister, um, has made an official request to the Director General of the World Health Organization declaring um, our interests and our requests for an external evaluation um, to take place and commence exercises um, um, towards the latter part of this year to declare the country malaria free so that 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 in itself is going is a monumental achievement um, for not only the ministry of health but all persons that have been invo involved in malaria um, from the control phase to where we are now in an elimination phase so uh, you're talking about over two to three hundred community health workers mal malaria voluntary collaborators um, supervisors and workers that have been there for 20 30 plus years so there are benefits that come with having that malaria free status so of course you um, once you're given that status you join a small group of, of countries argentina paraguay um, El Salvador, which um, was declared malaria free in, in, in um, February 2021, mm -hmm. and, and next in line uh, uh, is Belize. So once you declare that and you share your experiences and your stories, it serves as a motivation for, other, for countries that are battling malaria and, and also dealing with the high uh, mortality rates. Mm -hmm. In 2020, you are looking at over 600,000 deaths attributed to malaria. Um, over, I, I believe it was, um, um, if I'm not mistaken, we're looking at over 241 million cases in 2020. So there is an experience to share. Mm -hmm. Also, um, having that malaria-free status, um, it also has an impact on tourism because the CDC publishes that travel advisory that is shared with all travel um, agencies mm -hmm. so having been listed there or not listed there i should say or having be, been declared as a malaria free country it there's an economic benefit in terms of tourism so when you look at the introduction of chikungunya and zika you had cruise ships mm -hmm. being diverted yes. yeah. you have persons that basically um the, the entire um, tourism industry within the Caribbean and, um, and the Americas was disrupted. So once you have that status, um, it, there's an economic benefit. Also, the economic benefit trickles down locally because you're talking about um, uh, avoiding a loss in terms of productivity in the workforce. Mm -hmm. So um, when, a, when, a, when someone is sick with malaria, you're, you're out basically three, um, anywhere from three to four weeks. Um, and it's and it's a disease that is can basically spiral from one case to dozens of cases yeah. within a matter of days. So, I think there are multiple benefits in terms of um, uh, for the country. It's a monumental achievement. There are many persons that have been um, involved in this, um, and and locally, um, uh, as I said, I, I mentioned a few of the, the stakeholders, but uh, in terms of regionally around 2013 i believe it was uh, there were many agencies involved in in this region to basically uh, give countries a little push and reorient um, have a reorientation of their programs mm -hmm. so you you had of course paho um, leading the way the the idb the global fund clinton clinton health access initiative um th th there were so many stakeholders um that even to this day behind the scenes they continue to to, to support the program uh, and pushing us so um we continue to be part of a regional malaria elimination initiative mm -hmm. being funded by the um, global fund and spearheaded by the idb and that project will basically continue um well into 2023 at least um initially um and in the case of Belize, it will be more, uh, more um, in terms of focusing on how do we prevent the reestablishment of malaria going forward. Because the easy part 
I believe was getting to zero. The hardest part will be preventing. So if you look at the borders being open, new industries in terms of, um, um, you look at Santander, um, who import labor from Guatemala and other Central American countries coming from endemic areas. Um, as you are, all are aware, um, there's a shortage of migrant workers in the, um, in, the, in the banana and citrus industry at this time. These workers have to come from somewhere. And so we have to fight, the government has to uh, see how they facilitate these workers coming in. So these workers will basically be returning to the country in the months ahead. And so th these are avenues for the reintroduction of malaria in Belize. So going forward for us, it's to put measures in place and have a surveillance system in place that if you get and you will get imported cases, that you could detect those early to prevent transmission from being re-established. We get cases from Mozambique, Africa, Equatorial Guinea, Paramaribo, Suriname, Esquintla, Guatemala. There, there's so many. Every year you get mm -hmm. a, at least a couple imported cases. And Belize, not only foreigners, Belizeans living abroad, working abroad, uh, and, and, and traveling abroad. So uh, I think that the work basically starts now. And, and if we thought that it was easy to, 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 to get to, to zero, I, I think that um, the challenge will be maintaining zero, which is where our team... Uh, and that is where I want to bring Dr. Dr. Job into the conversation. So with, with Belize being at zero, I imagine that other countries are trying to get there. So how are you, um, how are you as the Malaria Advisor for PAHO, um, working on that campaign for other countries to maybe follow the Belize model? I mean, this is a big success story, actually. Yes. Uh, Belize is one of the big examples for the region, as Argentina was a couple of years ago and El Salvador last year, as Mr. Bostita was saying. PAHO is working with all the countries. I mean, some of them, the burden is a little bit higher than Belize. That's why it's not as, as easy as we say. Mm -hmm. But we work with them to decrease the burden of the disease to try to reach that stage, the stage where Belize is now to zero cases until we eliminate the disease completely from the territories or borders. I mean, there are some criteria, I believe you will be asking question about how Belize will be certified as malaria free, what we need to be certified as malaria free. We are trying or we are working with the countries in the Americas, all of the countries of the Americas where malaria is still endemic to bring down the cases and then which zero cases for three consecutive years after that the country can request uh, uh, the malaria certification that's that's the way we work with them i mean belize is a very good example and uh, as salvador was last year in argentina a couple of years ago paraguay also and i i think to complement what kim was saying in regards to certification as well um if we look at the two populations that are most affected by malaria are infants under the age of five mm -hmm. and also pregnant women. Mm -hmm. So it also has a big impact on our health indicators for the country. So it's a huge public health success if we can get certified as malaria free as well because it would also demonstrate how our public health system has also advanced as well in also reducing mortality in these very vulnerable populations as well. Definitely. If I may jump in also, the right. burden of the system will be reduced. I mean, when you don't have malaria as a big concern anymore, I'm not saying we don't have surveillance for malaria, but at least we know it's eliminated. The morbidity is reduced. I mean, the health system will be able to deal with other diseases that are not malaria. I mean, it is good for the health system per se. Uh, that's why it's a very good success story. regional malaria elimination initiative project a lot of times when you hear a project you think oh it's a one-time thing and when the money is finished then we go back to where we were and the interesting with this project is that it also required a lot of counterpart funding meaning that the government itself had to put in a huge investment into eliminating malaria in Belize and then maintaining the zero malaria status so there is ownership as well from uh, from the government side. There's uh, the biggest investment, like I said, was from the government. And there we were um, given some indicators 
Um, and if we meet these indicators, there's also a pay for performance bonus that you can get back. So there are some um, incentives mm -hmm. to continue as well. And hopefully with the ownership that we'll take on, it will be something that we'll be able to sustain rather than just see it just as a project, a one-time project. So today being commemorated as World Malaria Day, what activities are we looking forward to? Yeah, um, so unfortunately, uh, while we have activities uh, planned, um, we, we are competing with um, uh, Vaccination Week in the Americas, which yes. is a very important and, 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 and big event. Um, and then there's also um, Laboratory Week this week. Um, and then there's a malaria day, World Malaria Day um, today. So um, we're actually working um, as a group uh, in the different um, districts. And um, there's no one set activity for today, but um, it's actually um, spread out uh, for the entire work week where we'll be having uh, different visibility events or being a part of some of these visibility events in, in terms of um, health fairs and testing campaigns uh, and things like that. So one of the, the, the bigger activities that, that we've been working on um, over the past weeks is working with the banana farms in the south. So there are like 21 major banana farms in the south and um, part of the requirements of these farms is to have a health and safety officer. And so we, we are actually expanding, doing training even during malaria week um, um, expanding uh, in terms of our training to to uh, to basically extend uh, expand our testing network. So we mentioned about workers, uh, migrant workers coming in. So uh, we want to have testing available at these farms when 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 a worker is employed uh, at these farms or whenever they have any febrile episode, we will be able to test these persons uh, on site. So. Um, th th there's multiple activities that, that, that um, you guys, I'm sure, um, in the media will, will be seeing throughout the course of the week, but it's being integrated quite a bit, uh, as I said, due to the other um, um, health priorities this week as well. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us this morning. Unfortunately, we are out of time <clears throat> for today, but uh, any last comments for our viewers for World Malaria Day and the initiatives that we should take to keep Belize malaria free? Um, I think uh, it's just, sorry, go ahead, Doc. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, Doc. After you, um, ladies first. So it's just to say that um, we have to always think malaria, mm -hmm. even though we don't see it. We don't, in your generation, you might not see anyone who suffered yeah. malaria. You still have to think malaria because the risk of importing malaria is there every single day, mm -hmm. as long as we have our borders open. It's not something we can prevent. So we always have to think that. And my other thing was to, give some recognition to the vector control teams and the districts and the community health workers and voluntary collaborators who may not have had the opportunity to be here, but mm. they work uh, constantly and in difficult conditions many times to make sure that we can maintain this zero malaria in Belize. And uh, Dr. Joe? Yeah, my, my final word would be the challenge does not stop there after you eliminate malaria. Mm -hmm. in, as Dr. Cynthia was saying, we need to continue thinking that malaria is near us, it's not too far, mm -hmm. if we don't have a good surveillance system. It is one of the requirements, one of the criteria for malaria elimination is having a good surveillance system in place to be able to detect any imported cases for you to avoid malaria reestablishment. We don't see it, but it is around us. We need to have a good surveillance system, capacity to detect, capacity to treat, even though we don't have any malaria cases in Belize anymore. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for, for joining us. And um, for everyone at home, remember, think malaria always for this day of World Malaria Day. And we that will take our short break. And when we come back, we'll be wrapping up our show for this morning. Stay tuned.